one. You're on. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in to another episode of Stay at Home and Brew It. Today, we have a special episode for you. We're going to do booch talk. We're going to talk about a little bit about kombucha, and we're going to do it with James Lalon here. James, go ahead and introduce yourself. <laughs> yeah, we're going to call it by its fancy name, which is kombucha. Uh, now, kombucha, for most of y'all out there, is something a little bit different. You may already have your preconceived notion about it. I know that uh, James did uh, when he first started it. Uh, he really wanted to. Um, he really wanted to get into it because it's a. Oh, oh. You sure? Oh fuck! All right, uh, it's not plugged in. <laughs> <laughs> you, say you couldn't hear James or anything. All right, audio three. Okay. All right, started all back. <laughs> in to come uh, stay home and brew it uh our new series today we're going to be talking about kombucha so there you go james i actually get to say its full name now um and i'm talking today with uh james line go ahead and introduce yourself hello james line long time beer brewer meat maker and uh starting to dive into kombucha about two three months in and it's been a lot of fun so far uh, may I just ask you real quick, uh, Mr. Lalonde, uh, who got you into kombucha? So I, well, I'll just call it out. I got a girlfriend that decided that she was uh, uh, buying it all the time. And I said, wait a second, that looks expensive. Let me check it out and come to find out the, uh, the amount for one bottle is quite a lot more than we can do it at home. So, you know, it was a girl. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's where mo we get most of the best things from around here uh and it's from a girl yeah and it is one of those things that is nice to brew with family members or just having somebody else there to take into the process so you know that uh sometimes even if you're not doing it correctly somebody will always be behind you to correct you as well oh exactly well you know how it is uh, anytime that you're already brewing and know how to ferment as soon as somebody says fermentation, like, oh, I can do that. Uh, and like I say, I'm a dabbler of all things fermentation. So if you can ferment it, I've, I've either checked into it, learned the basics of it, or did something along the fermentation line of it. Um, I guess we're going to go ahead and get into kombucha. Uh, now, wait, 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 wait. Most people don't even know what is it. Yeah, that's that's what we're going to start with. Uh, so one thing that's different um, from kombucha that beer has is a lot of framework and steps in it. Uh, with kombucha, it's kind of the wild, wild west in that it's a fermented drink from China that's very, very old. And when it comes to things that are very, very old in the world, what people try to do is they try to change it and make it their own. So through many, many years and generations, kombucha has actually changed from what it originally was and is now something totally different. Uh, now, James, do you know what a SCOBY stands for? SCOBY? I have no idea. I know it looks like a pellicle to me. See, he's brewing and he doesn't even know what it stands for, but it is an acronym. Uh, it is a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast that's the name scoby um so from that name you really get the breakdown of its fermentation uh, now a lot of ferment and a lot of fermentations are uh a little bit different this fermentation is more like pickling vegetables uh, you're using those enzymes that are in it we do share a scoby uh, one scoby that i have actually shared with james lalon um is just the starter tea, um, which is more important, I believe. Now, I'll say this for me because there's a lot of groups out there that will gracefully disagree with me, uh, and it's about how you attack it. If you attack it from a beer standpoint, uh, you know, we are strict on sanitation. We have these regiments that ensures that the yeast has the best available environment to grow in, but with with the kombucha, you're doing something a little bit different, and that's creating a good environment for bacteria and your yeast. And it's important to balance those out, really. 
Uh, James, you have any questions so far? No, that was that was where I was uh, mistaken at the very beginning. Is is you hear so many different people uh, have their ideas, and I made the mistake of, of grabbing a a, a scoby, uh, and it had another bacteria in it, and started growing mold. Uh, probably also I did not do the sanitation that I normally do for, for beer because you start to get a little bit lazy. Uh, and then as soon as I flipped over and followed my normal sanitation methods for beer, uh, then I found that I was starting to make a good clean product and, and mold wasn't growing. And that's a most important thing in kombucha. When it comes to uh, things getting into your batch, a lot of important things is... Uh, um, the most important thing is definitely ensuring that you have a correct pH level. Um, and that has to do with having enough starter liquid in your kombucha to make sure that you can bring it down to a safe level. Um, go ahead. So what's that rule of thumb? One pint per gallon? Uh, I do one pint per gallon. Uh, it's actually overdosing it just by a little bit. And the reason why I overdose it is because you want to make sure that you're not getting any bad kind of mold in your kombucha. Once you get mold in your kombucha, just like beer, it is very hard to get it out completely. The mold spores will spread like wildfire, and that's definitely something you want to stay away from. Uh, they'll also inf won't they, they'll infect your, your, your pellicle or your scoby, and then once they get in, that scoby, for people who haven't seen it, looks like rubber. And do you it, have one uh, you can pull out real quick? Oh, absolutely. Oh, he's about to pull out a scoby. So, uh, maybe you can see it. It's uh floating on the top here. This this little ring, you can't see so, anything. Oh, yeah, I can. <laughs> can you see that now? Uh, yeah, Ro rotate it around to the back where you don't have the label. There we go. Oh, there it is floating. Why don't you tell me that? <laughs> so, there she goes. Yeah, so I just have a little plastic bag. This is a, a, a new starter, um, but you can see that floating on the top. It, it looks it looks just like a, a pellicle for anybody that's uh, made sour beers. It, it looks just like that. It's a big old rubbery um, mass sitting right up on top of your, uh, your fermentation. And it is vegan. Uh, a lot of people will take their scobies once they are past their lifetime and then uh, actually put them in their oven at 400, make sure they dry it all the way out, and then you can flavor it with any kind of fruit puree that you want, and you can make fruit leather at home. I don't know. The way that looks, I don't know that I want to do that. When it comes from, when it when it has to deal with beer people, beer people are a little apprehensive when it comes to stuff like that, because usually that's a no-no in the beer world. Uh, you don't want to see anything like that. So, so we kind of hinted on something, and, and I'll dive into one of those secrets that you told me oh, and we, don't do we that. talked about it specifically was so if i'm a brand new person and i want to get started and i got a friend james he makes kombucha a bunch right now and i want to reach out to him to to get um a scoby or a starter what i what should i really give that person okay so like i said this is going to be a lot for me uh because i have to tiptoe a line of of kombucha lovers. Um, for me, what I give my friends is uh, over dosage. I almost give them a gallon full of starter. And what that starter is going to do, I make sure my starter is at least a year old. And the reason why I do that is because the acid level in it is going to be so high that even if they didn't do their steps right, I know that once they put that starter in, that's going to be enough for me to say, hey, that's going to be a safe pH for you. Um, a lot of people will include scobies into what they get. Uh, and for me, that's just another thing from random people that, you know, you really don't want to take home because you don't know what their actual culture is made out of. And one of the key things that I say for people that are brand new is that what you put the starter in is not going to be what you drink. That first round, you're going to throw that out. And the reason is, is because you're building up that bacteria level, you're building up that yeast level to, main, to maintain the balance in there. And so when you first do it, you really don't want to drink that. While it is fun to taste, and I have tasted a lot of it, um, 
you're really using that to prop up your next batch. And I don't know uh, about you, James, but uh, did you start small and then prop it up in batch size? Yeah. Yes, exactly. And that's what that's what this one is. I, I took a about a cup um, to put into a uh, two to one, three to one to get it up to a quart. So I over overdosed it, but I took an existing batch and uh, brought it up to a quart level. So then I can take this batch and put it on a gallon. And then by then, it'll start getting a lot healthier. It'll start uh, fermenting in the time you want it to ferment. This is about two weeks old to get a nice uh, pellicle on top of there. Uh, and then once it, I've found, once it, I get about three or four batches in, then it gets thick and starts to, to do what we want it to do. Yeah, you really want them thick and pearly white. The whiter they are, the better they are. Uh, it just means that they are a symbol of health at that point. Uh, if you get one that's turning a little brown, that's when you know that it's getting a little bit past its life cycle. Uh, and and once you start, it gets very hard to stop because the SCOBYs keep on getting created. And it's one of those things where you have to find something to do with them, either compost them or even throw them out. Uh, do you, what do you do with yours? I throw them out. Well, I, I haven't been far enough to where, I, where I've gotten uh, some that I truly need to throw away. I had a couple of bad ones. I have one that's in, that's um, following your uh, your last comment. It's starting to get a little brown on top. Yeah. Um, it's really the the first batch. It's about two month two months in. Uh, but I but I think that just it's been stressed out. Uh, and I can see that it's starting to change. And I also see that it's taken now about 10 days to get into the right pH range, which is putting the dots together. I'm still learning. This is so new. Um, what you just said and what I've been experiencing with this batch, uh, it's time for it to go. Yeah, and and it's it gets very hard to tell when your uh, SCOBY is getting a little bit tired because you do make so many of them. And then for you to throw it away after you know that batch isn't uh, fermenting enough, you get kind of confused at it. So it is one of those things where you have to pay attention to pretty much uh, everything on it. But you don't want to pay so much attention that you're checking it every day, tasting it every day. You know, you want to kind of get a routine. About how often are you tasting your batches off? I usually leave it alone until it gets to six days, and at about that six day, then what I what I first do is is I'll pull a little bit, and because of making meat, I've got a pH meter, and so I'm I'm checking the pH first. Uh, I found in my first few batches that uh, my taste, because I'm used to drinking sour beers, to what the true pH should be, I was way off, and, and it went to vinegar way too fast. It wasn't working. Um, because I, I don't mind that super sour, right. but it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't enjoyable. And I was going well below 2.5 pH. And that was one of my questions early on is where do you know that you're done? Uh, what, what pH range is good? Um, I know it's a, it's, it's a range because everybody's tastes are different. And then what you do after the fact, which we'll get in a little bit may change where you stop at. Indeed. So, uh, just re yeah, re recapping to the beginning, uh, just in case for y'all who uh, missed it when we didn't have audio. Um, now, kombucha is a fermented tea drink. It ranged from China. China was the uh, original drink maker of it. Um, they wanted a nice fermented tea. Uh, and that's what we recreate here in the U.S. now, that it's gaining popularity due to people having, you know, high blood sugar, um, uh, and wanting to back away from the very sugary soda, 70 grams of sugar that we that we consume without thinking about it all the time. Uh, so right now we're going to go over what kind of tea can you use in your kombucha. Um, I don't have any real preferences on what tea that you use, but I do know that if you use Earl Grey, it will turn out horribly bad because... Earl Grey has antibacteria in it, and so what that does is it totally kills your bacteria in your in your uh, starter, which will then lead to you having a yeast overgrowth, and that will be bad because 
one of the sh many strands in kombucha is actually uh, Canada, which will cause a yeast infection inside of a person if you're not keeping your yeast in check. Um, now, um, I use green tea, black tea. Uh, I, I really shy against using any flavored teas in your primary. And the only reason is, is because once you mess that starter up, you put that into each one of your batches. So if you use a flavored tea, you now have to use that flavored tea for each batch that you make. Um, James, what kind of tea are you using over there? I'm using just regular black tea. Um, I'll buy regular old-fashioned Lipton. I found that's been working better. I tried to go with some uh, a different specialty black teas. And lately, the Aldi brand, regular plain Jane black tea has been working the best. Yep. Um, I, I've seen that same thing, your uh, experience. I tried using Earl Grey, very quickly saw it not performing way I would have expected to. And um, I've also tried to use a, a specialty tea that I bought out of a, a coffee shop. And it's Ooh. a Chinese tea that has a smoky note to it. Ooh, well, it my. completely... Um, infected everything uh, in that batch. Even the next batch was just excessively smoky to the point that it was not enjoyable. Now, I'll, I'll kind of relate this back to mead because mead and kombucha are kind of kind of cousins in this whole fermentation thing, along with seltzer as well, because you're, what we're doing is we're feeding yeast very simple sugars and we're expecting it to go for a, a while. Uh, so what happens in kombucha when it starts to ferment? Your yeast will, uh, of course, spit out alcohol and then CO2. But what the bacteria does on the backside of that is it's going to eat that alcohol and then turn it into different acids. You get acetic acid, which, uh, which you get if you leave your bottle of wine open. You can tell it gets a little sour, a little oxidized. Uh, and one thing that's special about kombucha is that kombucha needs oxygen continuously to ferment. Uh, that's something that you don't see in beer uh, unless you're uh, kind of doing a starter on your uh, stir plate or something like that where you have the little foil on it. Uh, but kombucha really needs that oxygen in order to do that conversion process. A lot of people, when they make it at home, uh, one of the complaints that I see is that people say they get lightheaded afterwards. Well, that's because your yeast has overran your starter, and now you are making more alcoholic kombucha, um, as opposed to, you know, a healthy fermented tea drink. Uh, how do you control your alcohol? I, I, me, I don't. I just put uh, one cup uh, per gallon of sugar and let it run. See, I kind of saved James on that because the starter that I gave him, like I said, was over a year old. So what's that? what that's going to do to him when he actually starts using it is it's not going to eat all his sugar right away. It's actually going to sit and wait for about six hours. And then as the yeast comes up to that temp, uh, kombucha, by the way, needs to be fermented hot. It's almost like a kvike. Uh You want to go 80 and above. Um, never too hot, and you never want to pour your your hot tea mixture directly in the vessel that you're using, uh, and that is because you don't want to cook your SCOBY or your starter mixture. That'll make sure that you ensure a good fermentation process all the way through. You won't have no astringency or anything like that. You can tell when your yeast runs hot in kombucha just because you'll see it ferment very very rigorous and then you'll see nothing uh that's that's just the nature of the beast and then you have to wait for your uh your bacteria to actually catch up to that and that's around 14 days uh but it's also very dependent on your t on your taste unlike beer you're not waiting for it to hit a certain gravity uh i even tell people you're not even waiting for it to hit a certain ph exactly what james was saying uh sometimes People that are more uh, akin to sour beers will have a much, much varied tolerance when it comes to kombucha that some people that just started drinking it will be like, oh, well, this tastes like sour socks. That's great. Um, but you can make great kombucha just using the rule of thumb that, okay, 7 to 14 days, I got that. And then you're going to 
make sure that you check your pH just to make sure that it's food safe. Yeah, that's that's where I'm needing to use just to crutch on my own self and needing to use the pH. And, and what I found quickly is is get it down to the three range. Uh, otherwise, I just go I just go too sour. And one of the one of the interesting pieces that you just just mentioned was uh, talking about needs. And um, I, I find it's very similar in that we do so much of kombucha after fermentation. Yep. You, know, you look on the shelf and you see all of this stuff on the shelf. But but Cedric, you just told me, no, you just use plain black tea. Don't use flavored tea. Don't use anything flavoring. Well, how do you get all that in your kombucha? Yeah, and, and the flavor aspect really, really comes uh, after fermentation. After fermentation, well, I guess we need to run down the list for our listeners uh of how of how we're starting our kombucha so we're going to start with our tea our tea that uh james was mentioning i wouldn't advise uh getting expensive teas from anywhere else because expensive tea is only going to make your process get more expensive uh i use a good black tea some from a reputable company uh, once you make that mixture, you cool it down, and then once we cool it down, we throw in our starter. Now, after that for 14 days that we for f ferment on, what we're going to do is we're going to start moving to uh, our secondary. Uh, a lot of kombucha people call this F2. We know it as secondary. Uh, and what we do there is now we're going to try to figure out the flavor of our kombucha. Uh, there's many different ways. Some people use concentrate, purees, um, real fruit um and it's kind of like mead where you want to make sure that you sanitize everything before it goes in there uh and that's how kombucha people will get uh the actual fizziness into their kombucha is they will put the puree in the bottle and then rack their kombucha on top of it uh now if you're kegging kombucha it gets a little bit weird because when you put stuff in a keg you kind of want to filter it a little bit uh, most kombucha coming coming out of F1 into your F2 is not filtered at all. And that's because you kind of want to kick up that yeast. So you have a little bit to ferment uh, that fruit juice or the concentrate that you use in order to make that fizziness. Um, now, I prefer people to use glass when it comes to kombucha. Um, those little flip top uh, easy cap growlers work fantastic. Um, but if you're going for a more refined process, uh, especially those out there that actually keg their kombucha or any product like that. Um, I would say secondary it like a beer or a mead in a one gallon jug. Uh, and that's because when you secondary it all together, you're going to let those flavors meld and you're not a kombucha factory. You're not trying to do quick turnovers. If you take the time to follow the to follow the steps, you're going to end up with a much better product than what you started off with. Uh, it's all about transforming that regular tea that you just got into something else that's more phenomenal that you can drink all the time. Uh, and a and a big part of that is knowing whether you want to use fruit puree or real fruit or a concentrate and where you get that, and you kind of want to keep it steady. I've I've had great success flavoring with uh, the Loran extracts that we push all the time. And and that's because the mastership of those flavors really go into it as well. Uh, now, uh, James, do you use fruit purees or anything like that? So I, I've been um, using more juicing. And, and then um, what I actually broke some of those rules, I like to go to the keg, but we have, we have so much, I have kegs and so much carbonation. So... Uh, I, I've been finding that I can cheat a little bit on that and, and get the product that, that I like, but uh, I've used a little bit of everything I've juiced. Um, I really like doing ginger, so um, got access to I a really ginger. fantastic uh, juicer that we uh, that we juice it and then really filtered out uh, the juice before I uh, then freeze it. I'll put the the, the juice in, in a uh, uh, ice cube. So I know about how much I'm using and then, then have those ice cubes um, set aside so I can go ahead and, and uh, add it once fermentation is done. But I've done, I've done the same way with just regular 
um, concentrated juice, not concentrated juice, but the uh, the one hundred percent pure uh, cranberry juice, juicy juice. <laughs> yeah, well, not juicy juice. <laughs> and then I have I have this fun little. Um, you see this stainless steel mesh? Oh, guy? we sell those, don't we? Oh, yeah, yes, that's great. This Those is are exactly great. where I got that from. <laughs> this works wonderful. I put uh, hibiscus flowers in here, Love chuck hibiscus. it in the keg, and in one day, it's. I've got a hibiscus ginger. Um, I've done chamomile. Uh, th- kind of like what, a wet beer, chamomile? I, it, it, I've done a little of everything. Try it all. I love it. It's and, all about uh, experimentation, and what you get out of it will make will make what you drink that more enjoyable, especially if you made it with somebody special, uh, near and dear to you. It just creates that more, much more memories, yeah, especially well, on flavor combinations. Exactly. Something I mentioned, uh, last week when we were talking mead was, is tell people, go look at the, the, the forums on kombucha. If you want to get new ideas, because it's very easy to take two gallons of kombucha that cost you a buck and a half to make and throw any flavor out if it's bad you're throwing away a buck and a half you're not throwing away sixty (laughs) dollars that is true it's one of those things in kombucha where even a bottle can cost you three to four dollars uh when we're talking about 16 ounce bottles so just being able to make a keg of it uh sends it down it sends that price down way down (laughs) Yes, indeed. That's that's our bet. So as, let, let me throw in a, a kind of side, sideball uh, question in, in the middle of this. Is, Go for it. How much of this stuff can I drink? Uh, I like that it's a nice substitute for having beer when you get off of work because um, it has a lot of the same flavors and, and characteristics. But uh, can I drink three, four, five pints a day? That's a very good question. And how I'm going to answer that is, uh, by explaining what bad stuff is in kombucha. Um, what bad stuff is in it is it does have bacteria, uh, but that bacteria actually mimics the gut bacteria that you already have naturally, uh, especially during this time, during uh, the shut-in time that we have. Uh, it's good to take care of your gut bacteria because your gut is what supports your immune system. So uh, if you want to have a couple pints of it every day, uh, that's good for you. Uh, the only bad thing is make sure you wash your mouth out after every glass is because it's acidic and it will eat the enamel on your teeth. But this is talking about, you know, uh, abuse of the product. Uh, and then can it make you sick or da- or is it dangerous for you? Uh, it, it is dangerous for you if you don't properly source your SCOBY, if you don't have enough starter liquid to bring down that pH, it can get dangerous from you. Like I said, always get your starter or SCOBY from somebody that you trust, somebody who's done it for a little bit, somebody who's been in, you don't want to just buy it off the street. Um, I, uh, you know, for me, I, uh, uh, a mentor that I had was uh, one of the ladies from Kombucha Camp. Uh, she really, uh, we had a lot of discussions on it, especially me coming from the beer side. I had a lot of uh, suggestions for her to make her process a little bit better, um, which we had a lot of conversations about. Uh, and when it came to the wellness of people, that's what the mission of kombucha is because you really want to instill that wellness in everybody and and make sure that they're replacing their beer with just one cup of kombucha a day. I, I mean, even doing that um, will help you, especially when it comes to us beer people. We have that gut that bloats all the time. It actually brings down that, that bloating because it's helping with that gut bacteria so you can actually... Um, dispose of your food properly. That's what a lot of people will think when uh, they hear kombucha is their grandma, you know, get you some apple cider vinegar, take one a day, and that'll help you out. Well, kombucha is a little bit easier drinking (laughs) than apple cider vinegar, and it has a lot of the same health benefits as well. Well, and uh, that's, I I made a joke when I said four, five, six uh, pints, I I 
kind of knew where you were going to get with that. Is, oh, yeah. is two pints is two pints is probably good. Yeah. If you start getting more than that, you're really throwing a lot of acid down your stomach. Uh, you probably could deal with uh, uh, stomach issues, and that you never thought about it on the the teeth enamel that 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 it's eating you there. Just to to be careful, but um, to a lot, you know, and a lot of people we, we you know we like a lot of beer. But on the, on the same time, it's sometimes you just want one after work. And uh, I have found quite a bit, especially when you're trying to uh, take a few pounds off to, to have one of these uh, is, you know, not having the alcohol, not having the extra calories and, uh, and just as enjoyable. Your doctor likes it, too. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure he does. I'll have to ask. <laughs> and once you start slimming down, you know, your girlfriend's going to like you even more. Oh, oh. <laughs> So it is it is one of those special products that you can that you can drink if it's just a uh, kind of like a gap between a beer or something to just change a pace. Um, now, kombucha can have a lot of caffeine in it. And the way you get that is by using uh, green tea or matcha. You can use it in your primary as your primary tea or you can actually put it on the back side, which I do. I make a pretty good matcha mint lemonade. Uh, mixture that i love <laughs> so what what's some of the the flavors that that are your favorites like i said earlier one of my favorites has been using ginger ginger and lime and, and um i really like doing uh, hibiscus and ginger uh, what are some of your favorites uh so some of my favorites have uh, definitely changed right now. Uh, I do have one flavor in mind, and that is the Thai ginger that we uh, that we sell here at the shop. And then I do a little green apple with that and the Lorans. And those two flavor combinations absolutely kill it. You have the the Thai ginger has just a little kick on the back end, and the Thai ginger it's a candy syrup by Cascade. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with them. Uh, it is definitely to die for. With the little oh, bit yes. of green apple, oh boy, you get the sweetness from the green apple, and then that little chili kick, and the, and then the ginger Fine. makes a good party. Uh, Fine. Yeah, and then you can you can like as far as concentrates go, uh, anything berry. Um, again, strawberry is one of those that I would stray away from unless you absolutely have to use it. Uh, uh, dingleberry is not a berry. <laughs> juniper berries. Uh, uh, and I've seen a lot of people use juniper berries and other other spices that we have here, which is A-OK. -okay. I say uh, it definitely comes from experimentation of doing a lot of stuff. I mean, berries are the number one thing in kombucha. Uh, blueberries. So I've seen people that will uh, use chunks they'll cut up chunks of ginger fruits and just stick those right in the bottle and those people are soldiers <laughs> uh no those people uh actually do something that is more along the healthier lines um you really want to try to chop that fruit up or juice it like james does i think i got a cheap juicer from my mom she bought it you know 18 black fridays ago <laughs> and left it in her closet and i found it and started juicing ginger you do have to uh, filter it very well uh, i wouldn't recommend juicing watermelon or something like that or any melon it's a lot of water so you really don't want to do that it'll water down your kombucha uh, and just a quick snippet i want to share this good clean kombucha tastes like apple juice for everybody that has tried up uh, tried kombucha and said it tastes like something else um what the brewer was trying to accomplish in that kombucha, in that kombucha didn't work out. It tastes like good, clean apple juice. Have you uh, had any good, clean apple juice there, James? Oh, I had a little bit. <laughs> See, and once you once you get it, you really you really get a process that is you know able for everybody to make. I mean, even kids can drink kombucha. At the alcohol level is the same as orange juice. For a lot of people that didn't know that orange juice had alcohol in it. <laughs> that, that's a new one to me. Yes. Orange juice. So what, that. What I, we, I guess we went all the way through the process. We're, you know, home brewers and most people listening to here is probably a home brewer. Um, what equipment do we need? So uh, the equipment is a little bit uh, dumbed down as far as uh, brewers go. 
the equipment is just going to be a spoon. Uh, I prefer plastic. Don't use wood in kombucha for the love of God. Don't use wood. Uh, and then you want a glass vessel. Uh, I prefer to ferment in glass. I know that, uh, James, are you only fermenting glass? or are you I'm good? only fermenting in glass. I uh, put it in keg afterwards and then bottle it fairly quickly. So I don't, I don't like to leave it in the stainless long. Yeah. Um, but no, it's, it's in, for me, it's glass. Uh, because uh, you kind of need to get in there a little bit more, I, I found two and a half gallon uh, basic yeah. mason jars that you, you know, just storage jars and, and using those because you have a wide mouth on it. Um, you could use, I guess you could use a, uh, a regular standard carboy, but when you got to get that SCOBY out, you're going to have a hard time. Yeah. That's what <laughs> somebody asked if we were moving in the cheese making, uh, maybe the cooking, sh- the cooking show starts <laughs> next week, guys. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but for this, what we, uh, what we try to accomplish is, um, especially like you were saying, uh, you, it's really a fine line when, uh, choosing choosing your ferment vessel you don't want to use anything uh that's plastic um and the reason why is because the the acid will eat your plastic and make it very very flimsy so if you're using a five gallon car plastic carboy lifting that up one day you may just fall through the bottom of it uh so glass is definitely the preferred the preferred thing here and the preferred way to ferment uh there's a lot of places out there that will um, try to sell you on, you know, ceramic or something like that. That's just an upmarket uh, upsell. Um, just stick with plain glass. And you can find those uh, glass pitchers uh, pretty much everywhere. And they come in like gallon, one gallon size, which really uh, helps you on your intake of kombucha as well. That, that's, what, that's what I found. I, I, a couple other pieces of... Uh... I don't know myth or or what. So I want to ask you is I've uh, heard that you never should have a metal touch your scoby. It'll kill your scoby. Uh, now that is true for a lot of old metals. Uh, a lot of old metals such as copper and stuff like that will leach through uh, unless you're holding your scoby in a copper steel or something like that and just holding it there uh then that will start to poison your scoby uh it will it will start to eat it and then it will get sick from that point on uh but the way that you simply avoid that is just by sticking with glass um if you have a uh, metal spoon like we said like we sell here uh that's totally okay you just don't want to leave it in there um, say like if you're prepping something else, you don't want to just leave your spoon hanging out in there because it can, uh, your scoby will start eating on it. Well, and when you say metal spoon, you're really mean a stainless. Steel I mean, spoon. stainless 304 steel, not anything yeah, that, else. <laughs> I, I was, I was trying to, to, to fish that out of you. I, I, I knew what you were meaning. And then I knew that's, uh, that's critical is, is you don't want a, any form of any soft metal at all. And, and, no, um, having a stainless steel spoon, getting it from a homebrew shop, you're good. If you grab the one out of your, uh, kitchen counter, you probably should not. Yeah. Um, Cause it's full, of, it's full of other, uh, other metals that, that you just don't want. You don't want to touch your, uh, uh your drink and then put it in your body. <laughs> for sure for sure now we went from kombucha to cheese making on the chat that's great I, thanks you know, guys <laughs> i have not made cheese yet but uh you know yeah I but but i mean if you're a brewer Kimchi. then technically you can you can vary in what you make by a lot oh, yeah. <laughs> once no, you start no, brewing no you get into other stuff as well and it's all about diy stuff that you can do yourself instead of uh relying on the store to to really uh, make it for you. Uh, and well, it, most, yeah, most brewers you always find are good cooks too. So if you can do that, you can make anything. Yeah, and, and all it is is following a recipe and making sure that you have the right tools to succeed. It always helps that if you have a good mentor. Uh, I'm so glad to have James here that wanted to talk Booch with me because without him, you know, Kabucha in Texas wouldn't be uh, getting its stronghold footing as it is right now. Especially, oh, if we, especially if we could convert just one brewer over. Uh, 
uh, and get them making beer. And then while they have their downtime waiting for that beer and leaving it alone, hopefully, uh, they will uh, find some other hobbies to do that they can do around the house, like kombucha and other things that we do here. You lost James. <laughs> I thought I lost your video. All right, we got oh, you back. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> You're still there, man. <laughs> what did we miss? Like we've, we've got the chance to talk about all kinds of fun stuff. We're making kombucha. We we made that sure that we didn't call it uh, by the short name. Boot. Um, Booch. Booch is actually the name of alcoholic kombucha. So, okay. uh, so a lot of people that uh, make alcoholic kombucha, uh, which shockingly enough is all the craft beer makers, uh, they they also venture into kombucha as well. Especially a sour brewery uh, will find themselves sometimes making offhand uh, alcoholic kombucha because they have the certifications already, and it's just another product that they can get money from. So. That's that's another thing to throw in the wheelhouse so we, of breweries. We, uh, our base recipe we talked about earlier of just one cup of sugar. We're using right, just plain Jane white sugar, nothing fancy. Um, what else can you use, and how difficult is it to change sugar sources? Uh, now, one of the things is that, again, I'll go back to the antimicrobial or antibacterial, which is known for mead. Uh, you cannot use honey in kombucha. If you use honey in kombucha, you actually have to train your SCOBY and your starter. So what that means is, is that after you have an already established culture, you can use honey in the next batch to prop it up. But you have to use a little bit of honey at a time and kind of step feed your, your uh, starter liquid to make sure that it can take on the honey and make sure that it doesn't kill off enough bacteria to where you can still maintain that relationship. Good, good to know. Yeah. I'd heard and I'd heard of, uh, using honey before to me, looking at the price for honey versus the price for a cup of sugar. I think I'll stick with the uh, other and make mead out of my honey. Uh, and it's also one of those things that I will throw that out there now is that you can make alcoholic kombucha by substituting a uh, half a cup of your white sugar with corn sugar. And that, of course, will get you uh, more effervescence and uh, a little bit more alcohol bump in your stuff. Why is that? Does it... Uh, so the, the corn sugar that you put in it, uh, the yeast has to go through two steps to kind of ferment it, whereas the white plain sugar, it's just simple. Just one step, it eats it. Okay. Uh, so, so when you give it less tough stuff to – did I switch it? Yeah. I definitely switch it. Yeah, yeah. So corn sugar is a simple sugar, and then the, the white sugar that we get is more refined, so it has – it takes the yeast a little bit of time to eat the white sugar. It doesn't take any time for the yeast to consume the corn sugar, so you're going to get your alcohol first, and then your bacteria is going to start working on uh, the white sugar that's in there because it's a known source to it, and the bacteria loves sugar, um, which really helps it out a lot. Okay. So you're, that, that, that's starting to make a little bit of sense. You're, you're, you're going to stop it before it can go and... and... Uh, eat up all of the uh, the other sugar or the other alcohols. So you're you're kind of stopping it. You're you're balancing a really a two point fermentation by using two different sugar sources. Oh yeah, and then you're gonna finish that off with your regular F two, which is gonna add a little bit more sugar, but that's gonna be strictly for your carbonation. Uh, okay. Unlike beer, where we use priming sugar for that carbonation, you're you're using that that fruit juice on the back end to ferment it. Good enough. Yeah, I hope I uh, busted everybody's myth, and uh, it's been fun talking to you, James. You got yeah, any? It's been a lot, a lot of fun. I, I and I got to thank you, Cedric. This was uh, you're you're the one who really started helping me uh, learn a lot more. You've been a sounding board to take some of the the myth away, and and you read stuff on the internet everywhere you go, and a lot of it's good. Uh, you got to be careful of what you read, but having somebody to, to talk to and a little bit of a sounding board just uh, gets you to throw away some of the myths and also get past some of the mistakes. Um, like I said, I got one now. I can learn today just by this conversation that it's probably the last, uh, last pull off of it, throw it away and uh, take a new starter and get it ramped up. 
Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I'm always here to answer anybody's question about uh, any kind of odd fermentation. If I don't know, then I have a direct line to somebody that will know. Uh, and that goes for, uh, you know, any wild ferments. I think even Sto Stubby knows a little bit about kimchi. Oh, look at him. <laughs> so he does know a little bit about kimchi. So, I mean, all fermentation is fermentation, uh, which is what the stigma is for a lot of things that we ferment in life is that we need to understand that they're all fermentation. And when you're coming from a beer background, it's a little bit different when you try to explain things to people because you try to give them the most pregnant information first. Yeah. And, uh, do you have any more off the wall questions that I can answer? Maybe uh, no, help somebody out there. The, that was the most important ones. I want, is there anybody on the forum that threw any questions out there? Already. Yeah, we already wrapped those questions in. So yeah, we did good. Then. Yeah, we did good. Thank you guys for tuning in uh, to this episode of Stay at Home and Brew It. You can see we're both uh, kind of chilling in our home spots. I'm in Stubby's office, so I feel like a big guy now. <laughs> Woohoo! Uh, anyway, thanks guys for tuning in. I hope you all enjoyed uh, me and James going back and forth on this random fermented beverage that you probably never heard of. Um, but we hope to enjoy. Hope that you get into it. I know uh, Doug from uh, Cowtown is looking for a starter out there, so uh, we'll He's get it. He's got one. Oh, you gave it to him? Yeah. See, now the family continues, and uh, yes, <laughs> uh, making the kombucha family uh, part of your family is what we try to strive, try to do here, uh, and make sure that we're all part of your family. So. Um, if you have a SCOBY to share, just uh, email us at info at uh, Texas Brewing, and we'll uh, try to get some SCOBY sharing going. And maybe uh, we can convince Subby to bring in some uh, more kombucha things that we can enjoy. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Y'all have a good one. Y'all uh, stay safe out there, and make sure that you check on your neighbors. A lot of fun, Cedric. Have a good one.